Great. Thank, thanks for um, inviting me to talk about this. Thanks particularly for putting me before Matt rather than afterwards, because his talk is going to be that much more interesting than mine that I would uh, hate to have to follow it. Um, I'm going to be talking about, the, the title is Patient-Centered Research uh, from Consent to Outcomes. And actually, I, I just want to start by saying that the uh, session before this one, the one on clinical utility, was really also about uh, patient-centered research and patient-centered outcomes. In fact, I think the whole day has been uh, about that. A uh, question was asked at the very beginning, how does what we're talking about here differ from what PCORI, for example, uh, talks about with respect to patient-centered outcomes? In some sense, uh, patient-centered outcomes are those outcomes that matter to patients, at least that's uh, PCORI's definition. Uh, here we're going to be talking about that, but we're also going to be going a bit more broad uh, to talk about uh, out outcomes that don't just overlap with that, but talk about things that matter to populations and also to uh, health systems. Now, I want to suggest that uh, the, we, we could take uh, two different paths to responsibly integrating sequencing into clinical practice. There's lots of irresponsible paths that you could take, but there's at least two uh, responsible paths. One would be, I think, a traditional sort of clinical development path uh, where uh, we demonstrate uh, utility, clinical utility, and here probably in one of uh, Robert Green's or Muir and Curry's more narrow senses, and then later go back retrospectively to evaluate the impact of uh, sequencing on uh, psychosocial outcomes, economic outcomes, uh, and health system outcomes. The approach that Caesar's taken is a more integrated approach, I think. Uh, first of all, is to find utility uh, more broadly in terms of the outcomes that matter. But I think importantly, and that's going to be the focus of uh, this session, uh, it has from the start sought to integrate psychosocial, economic, and health system outcomes uh, into the evaluation of sequencing from the get-go. Uh, and if sequencing is a potentially transformative uh, technology in healthcare, and I think that it is, then Caesar's approach is, in my view, the more responsible way to proceed, especially because the technology is not going to wait for all of these um, uh, outcomes to be studied and evaluated and their impact to be known. So let me, let me say a word about what I think Caesar has taught us uh, so far about uh, LC, ethical, legal, and psychosocial outcomes. Um, uh, with apologies to the investigators whose work I don't mention, and also with a note that some of this is stuff that you've seen before from some of the presentations or earlier today, but just some highlights. So one of the areas, and many of the outcomes are yet to come, the CSER uh, projects are in general not complete and are still collecting and analyzing data. Uh, so many of the outcomes that, or many of the data that we have are really some of the early data. Uh, I think we've learned a lot, though, about informed consent and preference settings and some of the things that go on in the pretest. Uh, space. So in a project led by um, Gail, Henders uh, Gail Henderson, looking at heterogeneity and best practices in consent forms. So for example, some of the recommendations and best practices that came out of that work, uh, quoting from the paper, clarity about the limitations of whole exome and whole uh, genome sequencing as part of the consent, uh, description of the processes that will be used to determine which results to return, and the meaning of positive, negative, and uncertain results. Very important uh, pieces of information for counseling and consent up front uh, with sequencing. Uh, Paul Applebaum's work, this one of the R01s that's part of the Caesar LC consortium, uh, conceptual models for how we might approach consent uh, incidental findings or return of incidental findings. Uh, so uh, Paul makes a very careful distinction between uh, upfront consent to return of incidental or secondary findings versus a more staged or just in time approach to consent and, and works through the advantages and disadvantages of those two approaches. And then in work led by Barbara Bernhardt, uh, lessons from genetic counselors about consent to genomic sequencing. Uh, so for example, the importance of dispelling unrealistic expectations that patients might have about what they're going to get back and, some, and uh, avoiding some of the uh, disappointments that you, might get, that you might have if you don't get what you were expecting to get. Uh, we've learned something about patients' preferences for incidental and secondary results. There was a lot of work went on prior to CESAR on, CESAR on hypothetical uh, preferences. What do you think you might do if you were ever in this situation? But Caesar actually uh, did this with real patients, real uh, research subjects, making real decisions with real consequences. Uh, so uh, we learned this from the ClinSeq that most patients, or in this case, uh, probably you might say research subject, actually do prefer to learn sequencing results and that the factors that drive that are an interest in prevention for themselves and their families uh, and just a general philosophy or desire to know results. Uh, we learned from the uh, Baylor uh, project that most families of children with cancer, despite the focus on the cancer and, and the uh, tumor sequencing to, in, to inform treatment, agree, uh, most agree to tu tumor and germline sequencing. Almost nobody says no when offered the opportunity to have tumor and germline sequencing. 
And then when given one choice within that project, which is would you like to know uh, carrier results uh, related to any carrier status that your child has, again, despite the fact that the focus is on the child cancer, uh, most families are saying yes. We've learned something about uh, the challenges that clinicians and health systems face, and it's worth noting that there's a big focus in many of the CSER projects, and perhaps all of them, uh, on the clinicians as an important actor uh, in this process. So uh, Junho Yu from uh, Seattle has taught us that genetic professionals' beliefs about the return of incidental findings vary uh, by patient population, so uh, much more positive when we're talking about an adult patient, somewhat less so when we're talking about a healthy adult, uh, and more controversial when we're talking about children. Uh, the uh, issues of the age of onset of the condition, uh, more uh, favorable responses to return of results when we're talking about uh, a, a childhood onset condition versus an adult onset condition for a child uh, patient, and a great deal of controversy about whether actionability should matter, something like a 50-50 split on whether actionability should matter in terms of driving decisions about return. And then from the MedSeq project, uh, and also from our Dana-Farber CanSeq project, a real sense that primary care physicians, cardiologists, uh, and medical oncologists report being quite unprepared for the challenges of sequencing that they see coming towards them. And finally, a note about electronic health record integration. This has been a topic of discussion uh, this morning so far. Uh, we know uh, from uh, various folks within the uh, electronic health record group within CSER that there's not a lot of consistency about how genomic data find their way into the electronic health record or which section of the electronic health record they are found. So if you're looking for a result, it, you don't know as a clinician where to go find it or as a patient where to go find it. The most common format is a PDF type format, obviously not very interactive. Uh, there's an acute need for clinical decision support that's integrated into the electronic health record. And we know from the folks at the University of Washington that it's possible to develop alert systems uh, based upon pharmacogenomic results, but it's resource intensive, particularly given the fact that the uh, knowledge base is evolving in the way that it is. Uh, Stacy Gray and others from the uh, Outcomes and Measures Working Group has given us a very nice conceptual model of the kinds of outcomes that we might be looking for if we want to understand the psychosocial uh, and, uh, and societal implications of sequencing. Uh, and has, they have suggested that we focus on uh, preferences for disclosure of, seeking, uh, of sequencing findings of uh, patients or research participants understanding uh, in various dim uh, dimensions, the psychosocial impact, uh, the behavioral impact, the behaviors that patients and families actually take, uh, healthcare utilization downstream from sequencing results, and then satisfaction and regret about decisions, and then identified particular measures that can help us to get to these outcomes and areas where we don't have good enough measures and we really need to develop better ones. So these are some of the things that we have learned. There's a lot more that we need to learn, uh, and some of this we will learn as we get uh, more data from the latter stages of CSER. So the impact of return on patients and families, we're just starting to get those data now. And particularly uh, beginning to define patient and family-centered measures of value of information, and this will be something that I think Matt will uh, speak to. Uh, economic and health utilization uh, outcomes of uh, CSER. What are, what are the impacts in terms of economics and utilization? Uh, extending sequencing to and understanding the outcomes in community settings. Obviously, the CSER projects are primarily uh, tertiary care kinds of academic settings and in diverse populations, something that will be the topic of the next session and I think a major challenge. And many places where we need better measures of the key outcomes, uh, particularly with longitudinal follow-up rather than just one-time cross-sectional uh, follow-up. Uh, a couple of you may have seen this diagram uh, previously. Eric Green earlier suggested that CSER really focused on advancing the science of medicine. I want to suggest that it also focuses on improving the effectiveness of healthcare, some of the longer term goals that were set out even for uh, 2020 and beyond. Uh, how is it doing this? Well, in terms of advancing the science of medicine, uh, CSER is actually delivering genomic information to patients and clinicians, one of the goals that was set out in that strategic plan. Uh, and while well, I don't want to overclaim what it's accomplishing in this arena because it's really in very early days, uh, it's beginning to shed some light to, in helping us to address the impact of genomics on health disparities. And in terms of improving the effectiveness of healthcare, uh, CSER is facing in, in real world clinical settings the challenges of integrating genomics into electronic health records. Uh, it is uh, beginning to demonstrate the effectiveness uh, 
and also helping to define the metrics for effectiveness, something that is not an entirely empirical uh, task. And all of this will lead to uh, shaping of the regulatory questions that uh, sort of regulate how sequencing works its way into practice. And you've already seen some of the papers, for example, from Barbara Evans that have begun to address some of the regulatory challenges that we face. CSER is developing methods for educating uh, healthcare professionals, uh, patients, and the public about uh, genomic sequencing. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the insights from CSER, I think, are going to help us increase access to genomic medicine, although, again, this remains one of the uh, major and long-term challenges that we have. So I will um, stop there, turn it over to Matt, and then look forward to the discussion. Thank you.